Today we're talking about the best long throw projectors, and I'm here with our new editor at large, Chris Boylan. Hi, How are you doing? Chris. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? And um, I hear you were just at the Value Electronics Projector Shootout, where they tested the top projectors in the category. Yep. And we don't know who won, but I think you do. So oh, you probably do too because you read the article. But let's not, you know, spoil it for anyone. Um, so yeah, the it was a two day event. Um, it's the uh, projector shootout, uh, as you said. The first day was USD projectors. Second day is long throw projectors, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Long throw projectors, as you mentioned, are what we kind of typically think of as home theater projectors also movie theater projectors, right? They have a long throw, a long distance between the lens and the screen. Um, and this means when you have them at home, they're probably gonna be mounted on the ceiling or in the back of the room, um, as opposed to ultra short throw projectors, which are uh, mounted uh, at the front of the room. So, you know, makes sense, right? This is the traditional projector you think of, and most hobbyists who set up a home theater would use this type of projector. And the models, the contenders, here we go. Yeah. From 4,000 to 30,000. Yep. Or and there were um, three different technologies, or four, I guess you could say. There was um, a DLP, which was in the LG projector. There was an LCD unit, the Epson. Uh, and the rest were all J uh, Sony's and JVC's, and they used their proprietary versions of what's called LCOS, or liquid crystal on silicone. So Sony calls theirs SXRD, and JVC calls theirs uh, DILA, D-I-L-A. It's basically the same kind of thing. It's similar to an LCD chip, but it's on silicone, um, which gives it a little bit different optical properties. Okay. And these are the top of the line models in each brand? Um, well, no, it's, it's, it's per, a range. In fact, what I mean, for, per price, I meant like for each price range or they, yes, uh, they did. They separated it into, you know, kind of a wide price range, but they certainly didn't want to put a $4,000 projector against a $28,000 projector. So, um, at the, at the sort of budget level between four and 7,000, uh, each of right. the manufacturers is represented. Um, uh, but, uh, the technological differences became kind of clear over the course of, of watching. Um, the shootout unfold. And uh, I will say, it's not a spoiler to say, sometimes you get what you pay for. And mm. that became kind of evident when we saw identical test patterns up against these three, four different technologies and different price points in the, in the shootout. So if you're up, if you could spend up to 26, 28,000, you will be rewarded with some, um, something better on the picture that you will be able to see. Well, what I would say is if you're willing to spend ten or 11000 you're probably going to reach the point of diminishing returns. Hmm. Um, yes, the flagship projectors were better. They were brighter. They had better contrast. But worth twice the amount of money? Not so sure about that. You know, I think, right. it, I think this technology right now, the sweet spot is probably in the ten dollars to $12,000 range if what we saw in the projector shootout is indicative of other projectors are out there, you know, within the same price point. And in terms of, well, I'll introduce the host of the event, or yeah. I'll let you introduce the host sure. and list a little bit of a background on how it got started. And Yeah, sure. So um, Robert Zone is on the left. He is the owner of Value Electronics in Westchester in New York State, um, not too far, about 60, 60 minutes outside New York City. Uh, and in 2004, he had this idea that it would be great to put a bunch of TVs in a dark room hit them with a bunch of content, test patterns, stills, you know, video clips to see which one was the best display. And so that was called the TV shootout. And that's when it was born, 2004. He's been holding them just about every year since. Um, last year, um, Dealer Scope magazine um, came in as a co-sponsor and they expanded the event out to UST projectors, which are more similar to TVs. They're standalone units, built-in speakers and smart functions. So it kind of made sense. They did a UST projector or laser TV shootout and then this year, they expanded that to home theater projectors, uh, long throw projectors. So Robert uh, provided most of the units from his own inventory from his store. Um, and I think except AWOL, possibly. Oh, sorry, that was UST event. Yeah. So for these, for the long throw, they all came from his store. Um, and on our right is Phil Jones from uh, projectorreviews.com. He uh, reviews projectors and he um, provided the MC duties. So he told us what to look for in the tests. He welcomed everybody. He described the technologies that were involved in the projectors and uh, even made a few jokes along the way. 
Way and, to go, Phil. <laughs> and there were a panel of judges, but there you were. were not one of the judges. You were in the room while it happened. Correct. So, I well, uh, um, like to Hamilton. maintain my objectivity as a journalist, <laughs> right. although not everybody does. Um, <laughs> all we can do is have goals, right? Um, so the judges that were selected were people who uh, who know display technology or know the content, right? So the people from the film and TV industry and then people from the video industry. No manufacturers, of course, would be allowed to be a judge. Um, so the people who work for companies in the industry were companies like, you know, cables or people who do um, uh, mastering of the content for Blu-ray, uh, David McKenzie, for example, um, guy from Viacom, Kenneth, who uh, creates content. So these are people who work with display and reference displays all day and they know right. what a good display looks like right and we're looking a little bit at well there's one of the projectors but we're looking yeah, I think at that was the lg yeah yeah okay so I, I explained this a little bit uh in the ust one but when you have a three chip projector um it, this is kind of how it works and if you look on the right there's a, it's a, a lamp that can also be a laser um or it can be three lasers which changes things a little bit but Typically what happens if you have a single light source or a single laser like the Epson has, it um, shines into what are called dichroic mirrors, which then separate the colors into their primaries. It separates into red, green, and blue. Um, each of those colors is then uh, shown through a imaging chip, in this case, LED, uh, LCD imaging chips, right? So you've got one panel is re reproducing just the green, one panel is reproducing just the red, one panel is producing just the blue. And then you have a, a prism in the middle that combines them all back together because red plus green plus blue equals white, right? So you have right. all the colors spectrum brought back together and then shown out onto the screen. So that's how they work. They have three different chips that each image a different color or primary color within within the overall color spectrum. All right. I, sorry, I, I will I'll, mention that if it's a laser, like a three laser projector, then instead of that lamp that you see on the right, you'll have an individual red uh, laser, green laser, and a blue laser that then provide, the rest of it works the same way though. They shoot through a chip and then they combine it all back together to, to uh, project it up on the screen. And what are the main differences other than the technology, but replacement um, costs between a laser and a lamp based? So, um, yeah, so I think the only projector in the entire competition that had a lamp was the JVC in the lowest price category. So that was the their $7,000 projector. Okay. Um, it used native 4K chips, native 4K DILA chips. But instead of a laser, they use a lamp, and that actually keeps the cost lower than it would be with a laser. Um, the advantage of laser is 20,000 hours of life, and um, that's a long time. That's like over 10 years of viewing, which by then you, you might even have traded in the projector on a new one because of how right. fast technology moves. Um, but in the case of a lamp, they last between generally between 3,000 and 5,000 hours, so a lot less than a laser would. But it's still still talking about you know three or four years of watching content, like you know three four hours, two or three hours a night at least. Okay. So, but the lamps get a little um, dim over time. Mm -hmm. Generally, the hour rating that they give you on a lamp is when it reaches reaches about half of its brightness. Um, so that the issue, I guess, with a, a lamp as well is that it has to be recalibrated over time as the as the lamp gets dimmer. I mean, you'll still get a picture, and you can get a great picture out of it, but you know the max brightness is going to change, so calibration yeah. settings have to change as well. All right, that's good to know, and we'll look at um, just a preview of some of the models, some of the mm -hmm. lower four to seven thousand dollar contenders. Yep, that one's the LG. That I is think it looks like the Epson. Yeah, pretty sure that's the Epson. That's and one of the Sony's. Sony's. Yep. And, and that's the JVC. Yep. So those probably were the four that were in the lowest yep. price category, the four to seven thousand. Right. Yep. And which one won? <laughs> oh, we're getting into that already? I don't know. I don't know. Do you uh, want to you want to keep going? We jump through each category and go which one won, or you want to get through all of them? What, did you have one of the screenshots up there, the, the pictures that I took of the screens? That might be interesting to bring up. Yeah, um, let's see. Because it, it'll give people an idea of what we were looking at. Um, uh, there yeah. were still images, video clips, and test patterns that were sent to all of the projectors at the same time um, through a you know, high-end switching device that, um, that uh, you know, allowed you to um, view the same content in multiple places. Um, and 
what we started to see was, you know, each of the different technologies definitely had strong points. Some were brighter than others. The Epson, for example, was 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 very bright. Um, some of them were better with shadow detail. Um, some of them were better with color accuracy and color rendition. Right. So um, we were able to see, again, the same te test pattern might have uh, uh, eight different women on the screen with varying skin tones. Um, right. And we, we would be able to see that, you know, immediately right next to three other projectors that were doing the exact same test. So um, was there some interference between the screens? Yeah, probably a little bit, you know, it, it can't be perfect. Um, right. But what they did on some of the tests to minimize that was they actually blocked the, uh, the projector lenses of the ones that we're not actively looking at. Um, okay. Like when you're looking at shadow detail or when you're looking at the test patterns that you know need to see exactly how low they can get in the blacks and how high they can get in the white colors or the, the right. brights. Um, it helped so that you weren't seeing any kind of bleed onto the screen from the other projectors or from the other screens. So I think the the pan, I mean the uh, the show organizers and hosts did a pretty good job of you know preventing uh, right. too much interference and you know providing kind of a, lo a level playing field. All of the projectors were shown on a 120 inch screen. Um, Seymour screen excellence. It was a, a 1.0 gain Unity gain screen, so it wasn't uh, editorializing the picture right. at all. It was just reflecting right back whatever the projector was throwing at it. Right. And these were out of the box. I think you said user setting closest to 6,500 Kelvin without professional calibration. Is that still yeah, so, on this? Yes. So there were professional calibrators there um, and there were calibration tools present, uh, but they did not uh, professionally fully calibrate each of the nine projectors um, the way that one would do when one buys one of these and, and takes it home. Um, so what they did was uh, to get close to that, they went into the user settings on each projector and they found the color setting that was closest to accurate. And they measured the output using test patterns uh, with a colorimeter and CalMan software to see which setting you know, was, was best on each. It could be cinema on one, it could be bright cinema on another, it could be filmmaker mode, et cetera, right? So they found the one that was closest to accurate for colors and then they went into the color temperature setting and they picked warm one or warm two or standard, whatever was most accurate, closest to 6,500 right. degrees Kelvin. And then they made some small adjustments to brightness and contrast. Again, looking at test patterns and using the measurement gear to see which, you know, to make sure that each TV um, uh, was, you know, best represented, right? right. The, the closest to accurate you can get without a full professional calibration. What they didn't do was they didn't turn on any of, or turn off or on any of the video processing settings that were not already on by default. So okay. some of the artifacts that we saw during the event were because, you know, the Sony was using digital reality creation because it's on by default and they wanted mm. to maintain the projectors settings as they were recommended by the manufacturer. So ah. if there's processing on by default, it's still going to be on. And that I think did affect some of the, some of the um, tests a bit. Right. So in some ways it's almost like a factory, default setting test who gets closest to <laughs> getting the best output out of the box um in some capacity i'm just kind of uh yeah i i would say i think moving forward i think the feedback was was um came in from a couple of places that on particularly on the higher end projectors it would be better to do a professional calibration like they do in the tv shootout um because uh, again, manufacturers may be going to compete on the sales floor and like you turn it on and you want to make sure that projector looks great with that content against, right. you know, the competitive models. So that may not always be the most accurate setting, right? Mm. It, and it may not work for all content, right? So if digital reality creation is, is, is working with HDR content, it may look amazing. If it's working with older, you know, standard definition content or standard dynamic range content, it might right. not look quite as amazing. I'm not saying it didn't. I'm just right. saying that having those settings on by default certainly impacted what we saw in the test patterns and in the content to a certain extent. All right. Well, well, let's start with the lowest price category. There's a bit of yeah. a price variance between sure. 4000 for the LG, 7000 yeah. for the PC. So, uh, yeah. So in this category, I think it's all about the black levels. Um, the JVC and the Sony were superior. Um, there's no other way to put it. They, you know, with the LCOS displays, um, even though the JVC had a standard lamp and not a laser, it was still plenty bright. And it just, it, you know, it, the white screen 
looked black. <laughs> you know, the difference between the brightest areas right. of the screen and the darkest areas of the screen was was very you know immediate and easy to see, and you know it gave you that punch that you you see in like a flat right. panel TV. Right. Uh, the Epson came close. You know, the LCDs um, and projectors do very well with contrast typically, um, and it it had some black levels that that approached I'd say the other two. The LG, I think it's it, it maybe showed its age a bit, and it we weren't seeing the low black levels in that projector compared to the other three. Right. And again, it's only when you put them all next to each other that you start to see these kinds of differences. You know, the black levels in the LG would probably look right. fine in a dark room with no other projectors around. Right. But when you see it up against the LCD and you see it up against right. the Sony and, and this JVC, that's when you're really starting right. to see the superiority of the more expensive projectors here. Right. And this is viewing in a completely dark or as close to dark room. Yep. Obviously, if there's any light in the room, yep. you're going to lose all of this black level. Yeah. And, you know, whenever somebody opened the door and came in, you know, coming yeah. back from a snack or a bio break, right. we're like, ah, close the door. Because then your eyes take a minute right. to adjust and right. get back to it. But um, but the, I'd say the organizers did a, a good job of right. managing and uh, preventing a lot of light spillage or interference between the projectors. Right. ISF right. says, if you're looking at picture quality, right. um, there are four elements that are the primary con contributions toward picture quality. Number one is contrast, right. black levels and white levels and the difference between them. Number two is color accuracy, so how right. well it does with skin tones, for example. Number three is color volume or color saturation, how rich the colors, how intense the colors right. look. And number four is detail. So right. you get, you know, everybody's like, well, it got to be 4K, got to be 4K. Yeah. Got to be 8K, right? right? The Ks don't matter as much as right. the contrast. I guess my point is even on the lower price models in this category, mm -hmm. although head-to-head, -head, they may not meet the standard of the JVC, they are probably or the Sony. Sony be, was also or, or excellent the Sony. black levels. Right. Yeah. Or um, just to give more credit for the, if you yeah. can't quite spend that much, sure, you're probably going to be quite happy with oh, the LG yeah. or the Epson, yeah. even though they didn't win this category is my... True. Um, and actually, uh, one of the pieces of content that they made a point of using, and I, I think they also used it in the UST, but they definitely used it in the long throw, was the, um, I think it's called the Long Night. The episode of Game of Thrones where the um, White Walkers finally came. Right. Like my daughter and I were watching the series together. And she's like, when are the White Walkers coming? When are the White Walkers coming? So it's season like eight, episode three, the White Walkers finally come and attack. Yeah. And I don't know if you watched that when it was live, but like right after that episode aired, everybody was on Twitter saying, that episode sucked. I couldn't see anything. And the reason they couldn't see anything was that the people making the, the, the episode were trying to make it ominous and dark right. and there is actually a lot of detail in that scene mm. that none of these people ever saw because they're watching it on crap tvs or projectors right, right? right. so when we saw that oh my god detail that yeah. i'd never seen before in that scene right. um you know like the expression on the white walker's face is like right. you, know, you can see that stuff and it's right. it was really enlightening because not all the projectors were able to reproduce that scene very well gotcha so, so yeah, JVC in this category, DLA MP5 was the winner. Um, let's jump. Oh, up. spoiler! Yeah, no, it's right. It's true. Yeah. The, the the JVC won, but it only won by a little bit. Okay. Um, the Sony was not far behind, um, and I think uh, LG came in last, and the Epson came in third. Um, now the LG did have a little bit of an edge over the Epson in uh, in detail, um, right. but. Not much because this particular Epson, um, it, it uses a, a quad phase pixel shifting, um, which means it takes that 1080p chip and it multiplies it four times to give you 4K resolution, as opposed to the other Epsons, which only multiply it twice, right? Okay. So the Epson and the LG both use pixel shifting, like four way or quad phase pixel shifting to create a real 4K test pattern. Okay. But when you look at the actual 4K detailed test patterns or native 4K content, you can start to see a little bit of the pixel structure in the uh, LG and the Epson that you really you couldn't see at all on the Sony and JVC, which do use native 4K imaging devices. Okay. Um, so pixel shifting is great. It allows you to take a, a less expensive chip and make it four times the resolution, and it, it really does reproduce detail well. Um, but in this particular case, and most of the content we saw, the native 4K chips uh, won. They just look right. And I... And I know this isn't part of the test, but they yep. they do make long throw projectors under four thousand. 
two thousand, three thousand dollars. Do you yep. have any experience with those just in the past off the top of your head? Like I do. Yeah. Um, and even though well, the Epson projectors are not native 4K when it gets to the lower price points, the you know eighteen hundred to like three thousand dollar price point, their 4K projectors, um, which only do the single pixel shift, I think look great. You know, and are excellent budget projectors. And I'd say they would beat some of some 4K like full 4K projectors. Um, the I think the 4050 that like Pro Cinema 4050 is what we're still using as a reference here. Um, the 5050 is also excellent. Um, they just do a really good job with black levels and contrast and and brightness at the same time. Well, contrast and brightness are kind of hand in hand, but they they're able to get the black levels low enough so that the contrast really kind of stands out. And to my mind, a, you know, a, a faux K right, <laughs> not full 4K. <laughs> Um, projector that does support HDR and 4K input yeah. um, can look better than a than a full 4K projector if you got that all important black level and contrast and and color accuracy and saturation going for you. All right. So there there are definitely some good budget 4K projectors that 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 uh, again may not be full 4K resolution or may use pixel shifting but still can create right. an awesome 100 120 inch image. So so what would be the the big jump up? Would it be black levels again from that budget eighteen hundred dollar to the four to seven thousand dollar range? What are we jumping up to? Or is uh, it well, if you know, if you're looking at the budget four K projectors, which are um, almost all DLP projectors, um, you know, you got those are single chip projectors, so you get the rainbow effect, which to some people they don't notice it. Mm. Um, me, it bothers me. Uh, like you turn your head a little bit and you start to see a rainbow on the screen. And and for those who have never seen it before, take a look at your DLP projector and then go like this. And then you'll hate me because then you'll see it and you'll never be able to unsee it. Um, so for some people, the DLP rainbow effect is not a big deal. Um, it's something that kind of bothers me a little bit. So the ups and projectors that are in the same budget, you know, range happen to be three LCD projectors. They have separate, you know, um, chip for red, green, and blue, so they don't have the rainbow effect. Um, so, but what do you get, you know, when you go from, you know, 2000 to 4000 or 5000? Yeah, native 4k resolution and, and really deep, rich um, black levels and, and, you know, color saturation. So those are the things you get when you when you upgrade. All right, should we jump to the mid tier price range? They seem to jump sure. up 4000 to get to 11. There's nothing in between there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are some probably some projectors on the market in that spot. But um, I think these are the brands that most people are looking at when they're looking at, you know, consumer uh, home theater projectors. Um, I mean, there, there are some projectors like the uh, Christie. I think Christie has got one that's like over $400,000. But <laughs> that's a little bit outside the price range of most people. Um, right. So so in the, and I, I don't know of any projectors that are actually uh, in the eight or nine thousand dollar range. I, again, I'm sure they're out there, but they weren't included in this competition. So, the two upper echelons of the of the um, of the competition uh, were solely JVC and Sony. And right. uh, as I, I said in the article, there there are probably more similarities between their picture quality than there are differences. Um, you know, there's different video processors, but they're they're all native 4K chips. Um, they're all laser driven. That price right. point. Um, Actually, interestingly enough, the JVCs also use pixel shift, but not to get 4K resolution. It's to get more than 4K resolution. So the JVC, uh, the less expensive one in the category, I think it's the uh, the NZ7. Um, is that okay? DLA NZ7, is that right? I think yeah. that's right. We get yep. Um, yep. That one has uh, just single pixel shift, so it kind of doubles the resolution of 4K. The NZ8 uses 8K E shift X pixel shifting, which basically um, it gives you 8K resolution out of a 4K imaging chip. So it's okay. doing the same thing that the 1080p chips are doing to get to make the, make it to 4K, and it's doing that on a 4K native device to bring it to 8K. Now it doesn't support an 8K input signal, but there isn't very much 8K content these days. Right. But by putting four times as many pixels on the screen, they can make the pixel to pixel transition smoother. Okay. And you don't see any kind of a, like a screen door effect or any visible pixel structure. So that's their little, you know, little trick, I guess you would call it that. And it's only in the NZ8 and the NZ9, the two more expensive projectors. So All the right. one that's in the middle category and the one that's in the top. 
and all of them look from the pictures they all all the jvcs look the same from the outside yeah yeah i think um you know you don't get a sense of the scale um the the very the very top end the nz9 is is big um mm. it's not monkey coffin big that's a that's a comment that someone made in the projector shootout that i liked it so much i stole it <laughs> looks like a monkey coffin um but it's got the lenses i'd say this big it's really a large lens and it's larger than any of the other projectors in in the competition um and by having more glass and bigger glass you, you're you get more light right. so the nz9 is definitely a very very bright projector um i think it's 3000 or 3200 lumens uh check my article for the specs but it's, it's up there right. in the 3000 to 3200 range and that makes a big difference when you're trying to do you know contrast you know the brighter you can get the better right. the, the blacks look right do you recall the distance they all were from the screen um well they so particularly the high-end ones but i think all of the projectors here had lens shift and, and zoom um okay so the difference being uh well i mean in terms of the distance they were all pretty much the same distance from the screen and that was i'd say between i want to say between 10 and 12 feet Okay. Um, so we had we had seats, you know, in front of where the projectors were. They were all, all mounted on uh, racks, like you know, the typical right. kind of audio video racks. Um, and they had to actually swap out a couple of the positions because the LG didn't have very much lens shift. Mm -hmm. So when they put it on the middle rack, it couldn't quite fill the screen. So they mm -hmm. had to move the JVC down. They moved the LG up, and then its lens shift was enough to cover it. So the LG and the Sony in the cheapest competition had manual lenses um not a big deal because you don't do setup on a projector very often right probably once and then if you right. move things around or change the furniture maybe a second time um but what that means they can't do is something that i find very cool which is lens memory um mm. with a lens memory you need to have a, 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 a an electric or a motorized zoom and a motorized lens shift and a motorized focus so you can basically have one lens setting for 16 by 9 content and then when you watch mm -hmm. uh, a 2.35 to 1 movie, you press a button, the image zooms up to take up the entire screen. You don't have to worry about an anamorphic lens. You don't have to worry about anything. Um, the only thing you have to worry about is a little bit lower brightness. So you would have a different preset for that. Um, okay. But that having that feature requires that you have a motorized uh, lens because you, know, you can't be going up and readjusting right. the focus and the zoom every single time you want to switch over to a 2.35 to 1 movie. So which models had the motorized lens or um, everything them? except the cheapest Sony and the LG. So the Epson had it, the uh, least expensive JVC had it, and then all the more expensive Sony's and JVC's had it. Okay. So I think it's a way of meet, meeting a price point. Um, right. The Sony was the cheapest three chip uh, native 4k projector in the competition. And it did that by not having a motorized zoom lens. Uh, it had a mm. manual zoom lens. You step up to the middle category and then it's got it's got the motorized lenses right right um all right so as we got to that middle category um as the competition i'm guessing you did the lower price ones first and then yes. you yep. saw those and then you went right. to the next and then mm -hmm. when they when they swapped those in was it like wow these are amazing or was it like hmm they're good but i can't remember once they swapped them what the differences were as um, as we stepped up, um, the projectors started to look a lot more the same than they did different. Um, I, you know, again, the Sony and the JVC are both excellent projectors with amazing black levels, great brightness, great color, uh, uh, you know, accuracy and saturation. Right. Um, what I was kind of a little bit surprised about, but maybe shouldn't have been, is in that middle category, right? You got two JVCs and a Sony. It didn't go like sony jvc jvc like you would think the two jvcs would be really close to each other in performance but that extra whatever it is uh five grand actually between the the lo the cheapest one and the more expensive jvc um made a difference in detail and black level and contrast right. so the sony actually came in second in that competition and it was i think closer to the top jvc um than it was to the lower jvc so okay. you would think again, JVC, similar technology, right. same engine in the back. Um, but they looked a little bit more different than the JVC and the Sony did from each other. Interesting. So what are you getting for that extra 5,000 
between um, GBC well, you're and the 8K pixel shift. So you're mm -hmm. getting that engine that takes every single pixel and gives you four versions of it. So you're getting the extra detail and the ability to upscale any of the incoming sources to 8K resolution on the screen. Okay. Um, so yeah, that was, I guess, the primary difference. Is, is that worth $5,000? I don't know. Um, right. It is to, to, to some people, I think. Right. I mean, again, I, I, I like the way that everything in the 11,000 plus category, I could very happily live with. I mean, I could happily live with most of the ones <laughs> in the four to 7,000 category too. Um, but it, right. uh, it, you know, again, they, they start to look more alike than they do different. And then it's becomes right. a question of the, the video processing. And do you like what the projector is doing on like some of the lower quality stuff that's coming in the stuff that right. isn't 4k with HDR? Um, because like I think in the middle category, the top category, I think the Sony won for brightness, but the JVC took um, you know skin tones and they're like kind of back and forth in terms of you know right. which one won the category. Um, but I, to me, I think that's why for me the sweet spot is in that eleven to sixteen thousand dollar category. You go right. up to the thirty thousand dollar ones or the twenty seven to twenty six to twenty eight, right. you're getting higher brightness which matters. Absolutely. You're getting better contrast. You're getting better color saturation because of the higher brightness and the higher color volume that comes with the higher brightness. Right. But that's to me, the point of diminishing returns, you know, you're, you know, why not just get two? <laughs> right. <laughs> because right. you could, you could buy two of the JVC uh, or two of the VPL XW 6000 right. for less than the cost of, of the top Sony or the top. Right. Baby. Right. So I guess that leads me to the question on the more expensive ones. Do you get a yeah. bigger screen? Can you go up to 200, 250? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, you absolutely. Can... I mean, okay. again, we were only looking at these at 120, 120. inches across the board. Right. Okay. So uh, those top end uh, JVC, JVC and Sony could, I would say, easily do a 200 inch screen. So okay. if you're if you're doing a, um, you know, really high end home theater and you're hiring a custom installer to put it in for you or you're just really handy. Right. Um, that's when the extra 500 lumens might actually make a difference. Um, and it is better. Don't get me wrong. It's not that it's not better. Is, right. is it $12,000 or 13 or $14,000 better? And again, right. budget, personal choice. You know, there are clients and Robert tells me about this. Some of, some of his clients just say, yeah, just tell me what I need. Right. And right. he knows what they're looking for. And he's not going to sell them the $28,000 one. If he thinks that their theater is going to be fine with the $15,000 one. Right. But those kinds of clients are like every custom installer's dream. Like, oh, I'll tell you what you need. And they'll bring it in. And the client's going to be thrilled because, again, right. at this price range or anything above 10 grand, beautiful, right. you know, beautiful performance. And depending on the size of the room and the size of the screen there, you know, a lot of these would be up to the test. Right. So is partially you're going on screen size as like in 120, even, even in the 120 inch size, you're still good. You're still saying twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. Well, I'll tell you. Um, I'll tell you the other area where it can make a difference, and I, I alluded to this earlier, right? So, if you're doing, if you really are a movie fan, right, and you want to do what's called constant image height, right? You've got um, one screen that that kind of transforms itself from four by three mm -hmm. to sixteen by nine to two point four to one, depending on the content. Then the extra brightness actually really matters, and it really helps. Because if, if you're using the built-in lens memory feature, um, right. then when you zoom in the central area of that screen and that imaging device, and you make it fill an entire two, three, five to one screen, it's going to be less bright because you're not using you know, the top and the bottom of that imaging chip, and you're not right. using the top and the bottom of, of the lamp, right? I mean, so the 3,000 uh, 3, lumens gets reduced quite a bit when you... Uh, in, in terms of what you're measuring, like right on a, on a 200 inch, you know, two, four to one screen. Right. Um, now there is another way of doing constant image height and that's with an anamorphic lens and the anamorphic lens doesn't really lose brightness when it's in the picture. Um, right. It can lead to some small amounts of distortion and a little bit of loss of resolution, but it doesn't lose any of the brightness because it basically squeezes the image and then stretches it back out to fit the screen. And it does that all without, without killing the actual image geometry. But that features it, like, yeah, like lens, lens memory, they'd right. love to have a brighter projector because it really helps them to maintain that bright image when they zoom it into fill a two, four to one screen. So on the anamorphic lens, you're actually putting a new lens 
the lens, lens in top. front of the existing lens. Yeah. Does it just mount in front or is there some adapter? How do you make all that work? Yeah. So there's, there's two ways to do it. Um, there's a, um, there's an anamorphic lens that goes on a sled and it slides into place when you need it for the two, mm. three, five to one or two, four to one content. And it slides out of the way for 16 by nine content. And okay. to get that to work without stretching everything out, there's a processor that squeezes it, right? It squeezes the two, four to one image to fit into that 16 by nine imaging chip or the imaging area of the right. projector. So when you have a sled, it slides in, you watch a two, four to one content, movie's over, hit a button, it slides out of the way and it, and it changes the, uh, the squeeze. Okay. Um, the other way is having a permanently mounted anamorphic lens. And those are a little bit cheaper because there's no motorized parts involved. Um, and what those require is that you ha actually have to pre-squeeze anything going into it, right? Because what an anamorphic, uh, anamorphic lens does is it takes content that's squeezed and it stretches it back out to its original geometry. So if you're looking at 16 by 9 content, like you know Game of Thrones or something, right. it's going to be squeezed into like about a 4 by 3 shape. And then mm -hmm. the anamorphic lens is going to stretch it back out to 16 by 9. When you're looking at a two four to one movie, it's squeezing it into sixteen by nine, and then the lens is stretching it back out to two four to one. So when I say okay. stretch, people think, "Oh, is everything going to be distorted? Is it going to be wide or fat or something?" No, it doesn't. It actually it has the corresponding squeeze and the stretch are exactly the same to compensate for each other. Okay, and for people that have no idea what we're talking about, <laughs> <laughs> there's an um, article. There's WTF is constant image height, and then and I go okay. into a lot of detail about that. In that all right. And you can buy Blu-rays in this format. Is that typically how you're going to get this ultra well, wide format? Actually, I mean, it's everywhere now. Um, okay. I don't know if you, uh, if you're like Ian and you, and you watch uh, like every star Wars piece of content that's ever been created. Um, but by the way, I'm, that's not a criticism. I, I do the same. Um, there are four series. Uh, it's set in the star Wars universe that are, that are episodic series on uh, Disney plus. Yep. Um, like Andor and Obi-Wan Kenobi, The Mandalorian, uh, right. Chronicles of Boba Fett. Anyway, point is, every single one of those TV series is shot at 235 to 1, mm. or 239 to 1. They're okay. shot to look like their movies. And I think a lot of TV content creators are using that now to try to make their stuff stand out as being more you know, cinematic than standard 16 gotcha. by 9 content. So the uh, Lord of Rings, Lord of the Rings, um, Rings of Power prequel, that was all okay. two, three, nine to one. I think the Game of Thrones one was like two point. It, it might have been two to one. It was wider than sixteen by nine, but it wasn't full two, three, nine. Um, and then those Star Wars shows, you start to see it a lot. I mean, maybe you don't even notice it anymore because you're just used to those black bars showing up for movies, right? Um, but there's a lot of content now that that is two, three, five, or two point four to one on Blu-ray, on Ultra HD Blu-ray, and even on streaming. So basically, if you're getting black bars on your picture at the top and the bottom. Yes. That's that's the content that we're talking about that can be exactly. blown up. I don't know. That's not that's not the right word, but expanded. Yeah, no, it is. It, it, it it's is blown right up. Blown yeah. Up. So it's blown up to fill your screen, but it does that without changing the the image geometry. So you do need to have a special screen for that. You need a two four to one ultra wide right. screen. And yes. if you don't want to see some people say, okay, you're trading letterbox bars at the top and bottom for gray bars on the sides. There are um solutions for that. There are screens that automatically bring in masking material to like mask out the areas of the screen that are not being used, whether it's the top or the sides. Or right. you can actually get a get some motorized curtains for about six, seven hundred bucks that right. roll into place when you want them in 16 by nine and roll out of the way when you're watching two four to one. So it's not right. that hard. It's not that complicated. It's the kind of thing a DIY person could do. All right. And we didn't touch on this yet, I, I believe, but the screen used in this comparison versus the screen you might use if you were yeah. buying any of these projectors. So yeah, um, the screen that was used in the shootout was a Unity Gain um, matte white screen. Uh, it doesn't um, doesn't focus any of the light uh, it, you know, back at you the way a, a high gain, like a 1.3 gain or 1.5 gain screen would do. Um, but it's a, a better reflection, I guess, of what's coming in, right? It, it, it doesn't editorialize any of the content. It just reflects it back at you. Again, it's called Unity Gain or 1.0 Gain. Right. Um, depending on where you're putting a projector like this, you might want to get a higher gain screen to accentuate the light output um, and make it a little bit brighter than it would be. 
right. that you can have some uh, some issues with that if you're um, looking at it off off axis because it doesn't reflect the light to the sides as well as it does back in front of you. Um, you can potentially get some hot spotting depending on um, the screen formulation. Um, what a lot of people do actually is instead of using a, a high gain screen, they'll use a gray screen that has less than unity gain. And the reason you want to do that is to accentuate the black levels, right? If you're starting with white, there's only so black you can get. If you're right. starting with gray, you can get darker. The blacks right. get richer. So if you have a really bright projector, you could actually put in a gray screen and still have a really nice bright image and the black levels will be lower because right. they're starting with gray instead of starting with white. So I guess the point I was getting at on the lower end models, you can tweak the screen, you could tweak sure. some of the calibration mm -hmm. to make them better than what you saw at the yes. shootout. I, I would say any one of the projectors in the competition could look better than it looked in the competition with a professional calibration. Um, okay. On a $4,000 projector or a $3,000 projector, people may not be investing in a calibration. Right. On a $20,000, $25,000 projector, people probably are investing right. in a calibration and may even have somebody come back a year or two years later to redo it, you know, to make sure they're always getting the best performance. Right. And typically you're going to set it once, but it could shift if there's a lamp, but if you're using laser, it shouldn't shift at, at all. I see. I'm not, I wouldn't, I, I'm not sure yet. I don't know sure. if lasers actually dim over time as well. It's just one fact I haven't researched right. yet. And okay. I should, I should know it, but I don't we'll know. I don't know if the readers are there or the viewers or listeners want to give us some uh, yeah. comments in the comment section down below after you right. smash that subscribe button and the like button. Yeah. Tell us about lasers. Do lasers get dim over time? Yeah, I'm sure there's at least 15 people watching this right now who know the answer to that question. All right, we'll look for those comments. Um, we haven't told you the winners yet. Are well, you... we did in the first. We said JVC won. Guess yep. what? Cut and paste that answer to the two categories below because JVC swept the competition. They got the highest scores uh, in the uh, low, medium, and high price categories. Um, again, it wasn't like uh, you know, it wasn't like the Sony got run over by a bus. There was some very, you know, very close scores. You can see them all in the scorecard in the article that has the details. To, yeah, the scorecard is probably here. here. Yeah. Let me get it pulled up. Um, and and again, it wasn't uh, it wasn't like the JVC was better in every single category, right? There were some areas where the Sony definitely um, exceeded the, the performance of the JVC. Uh, there's the scorecard. All and right, it's broken down by category, up. and people probably right. can't see it that well on right. the video, but they can get a copy of this if they view the article on eacoustics.com. Right, right. So, yeah, let's scan this pretty quickly. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think it's always interesting between each category. Um, Sony wins some, JVC wins some, depending yep. on how it's rated. And it's just really averaging out all the scores and coming up. Um, to an overall score. I'm right. looking at the most expensive one. It was a 9.5 for the JVC and a 9.1 for the Sony. The um, overall scores, yep. Right, but then if you jump down to the 15.999 JVC, yep. it also got a 9.1, um, which seems like um, make it kind of makes it the value winner, even though it's 15.999, but- Okay, so I think, People score things differently. Um, mm. And I think Phil Jones in particular um, was recommending that people, you know, if you think this one looks the best, give it a 10. Right. Which isn't probably how I would do it. Um, I see. So and, they and I were Phil. And, and I yeah. think, you know, he's, he's a great guy. And he's really smart. And he, yeah. he has amazing projector reviews, which you can read on projectorreviews.com. Right. But it's really hard to compare from one category to another for gotcha. two reasons. A, yeah, different judges score things differently. You know, I think Phil's point was that if this is the best, give it a 10. If the other one looked pretty close, give it a nine, right? Right. It, it, I think it would be ideal in an ideal word to say, well, okay, I remember all of the projectors I've seen in my lifetime, right. and this one gets a 9.6 in, <laughs> right. in contrast level. But you can't, right? All you're comparing it to is the one next to it, or the two next to it, or the three next to it. So I would say trying to take the 9.1 that came out of the mm. high price category and equivocate that to the 9.1 in the medium price category is not, is not the best bet, right? That makes um, sense. But there, yeah. there were two tens given 
It looks yeah. like, does that mean all judges gave it a 10? Yes. To get, to get a 10. And it yes. looks like um, the Sony got 10s on bright content. Yep. yep. And the JVC on near black. Uh, yes. That. Right. So one is, um, uh, one of those is bright content is uh, highlights. I think that specifically was like, there was two clips we looked at. One of them was a Blu-ray of, the art of flight, which is the crazy snowboarders that are getting, you know, airdropped into some, you know, remote location to create their own trails in these, you know, crazy mountains. Right. So there's a lot of detail there. That's an SDR recording. A um, lot of detail there that this it just, you know, gets blown out on a lesser projector, but you can see every, like, I wouldn't say every grain of snow, but you can right. certainly see it seems like that. Right. And then there was also um, on the Spears and Munsell test disc, I think maybe even the new one that hasn't come out yet. There's some scenes of like some horses in the snow and there's a background and, you know, being able to see every little detail in the clouds and on the snowy surface um, right. while the color and the horses is still being maintained. That that one would be um, brightness or highlight detail as well. The shadow detail came from things like that Game of Thrones clip that I was telling you about the, the long night. So that would be right. SDR material. Actually, no. I, yeah, I think we were. Yeah, we were looking at that in SDR from the Blu-ray as opposed to like say a 4k feed from from netflix um or from sorry from hbo um but there were other scenes that were used to to pick up shadow detail so i think what you're saying from that test you know the jvc got the highest score in the shadow detail area while the sony got a better score for overall brightness of the content so you saw that a lot yeah you know, they're kind of trading blows one of them gets a little bit higher in that category a little bit higher in this category and so it's fair to say they're pretty close even though yeah I mean, JVC obviously won. Um, all credit to mm -hmm. JVC for. Yeah. Oh, uh, you can pick that picture up there now because it's the JVC guys accepting all right, the award. Let's yeah. give them, let's yeah, give the them award credit um, since JVC was the winner of the old, of the long throw. Yeah, there they are. Yeah. Oops. Uh, there so, we go. Yeah. So um, what you see there are the the hosts, the helpers like Jason and uh, Brett in the red shirt. Uh, right. And and then uh, dealer scope guy on the right, Robert's there, and then the three other guys I think are all from JVC. Um, right. No, no engineers. Um, they were more like sales guys, and you know I think the general manager um, right. that came to be part of the event. The LG people did send some people who are a little bit more on the technical side, um, you know, just to kind of answer any questions during the UST portion of the event, right? Um, where they had you know a very strong showing. They did win the UST category. Right. Um, but I, I don't think those engineers stayed for the Sunday event, for the long throw event. Because um, they right. only had one, one horse in the, in the race and it was in the, uh, you know, it was in the lower price category. Right. So given your overall impression, two days, you saw ultra short throw projectors, yeah. long throw projectors. What mm -hmm. are your big takeaways? Um, the differences, yeah. Well, I think, you know, my perception of USTs in the past has always been... Uh, Eh, you know, because a UST to me is like a lazy man's solution. It's like if you, well, I mean, or a budget solution, right? If you really yeah. want 100 inches and you can't afford 25K for, for 100 inch, <laughs> you know, flat panel TV, okay. that's maybe 99.9% um, .9 of the population, sure. right? But you could do 100 inches or 120 inches with a long throw projector if you want to put the time and the energy and effort into it or hire somebody to do that for right. you. Right. But in the situations where you've got a living room, it's a bright room, you don't have a lot of space and you don't want someone to be, you know, putting holes in your walls and sealing the run wires and everything. You just don't right. want to be bothered. These USTs look great. And you're living with one now. Yep. Um, there I've definitely um, it's definitely up my perception of UST as a category to see what some of these projectors are capable of. The right. AWOL, even though it didn't win the event. That was as bright to me. It looked like an LED LCD flat panel TV. If someone just had put some stuff on there from the UST, the UST projector, um, yeah. if they had put that up um, in front of me and I was looking at it from across the room, I would have thought it was an LCD TV. Um, it wasn't. It was a projector, and it was big, and it right. was bright, and it was colorful. Um, it's also you know forty five hundred dollars, but right. on a one hundred and twenty inch screen, it's still a pretty good value proposition. So Agreed. that was the one. Yeah, the one in the far left. Uh, you can't really tell that it's brighter, but it's brighter. Um, it's a very, very bright projector. 
Now, maybe not quite as accurate on skin tones as some of the other ones were. Right. You know, but it, it's bright and it's it looks like, you know, a big TV. Um, I would still say for myself, if I'm putting in a projector in a home theater, I would I would go with a long throw. Absolutely. Right. You know, I don't want to I don't want to pay for a, a sound system to be built into my projector. I have one of those. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. I have one of those or I'm going to get one of those. Right. If I think right. my projector, I want it to be the best picture that it can be. And I mm. want it to have. I want it to have lens memory because that's really addictive. Being able to press a button and suddenly your movie just fills your entire wide two, four to one right. screen. That's cinematic. That's what, you know, that's what I'm looking for in a home theater projector. Right. Um, but yeah, again, living room, want a big, big TV. This one here is the LG. Um, right. Viable solution, you know, viable choice. I don't, I don't think it's a, uh, you know, I, I think I understand now where the fascination is and, and why consumers are, uh, you know, eating them up. Mm. So it sounds like the ultra short throw category surprised you yeah. and the long throw category just keeps getting better. Like how much better can they get? That's one of the questions I keep asking myself. Like, yeah. And you know, how much more black can they get? And right. the answer is none, none more black. <laughs> Once you get spinal the black. Tap, spinal tap reference. Sorry for any of spinal tap fans out there. Um, Smell the Glove was the name of the album. And yes, we are going to get canceled, I think, after making those kinds of references. But anyway, um, I would say I can't imagine them getting a lot better. Um, but I'm, I, I'm loving the fact that they've got these amazing $25,000 projectors because guess what? Those black levels are going to be down for, to like ten grand or less two years from now. Right. Um, it's all, it always trickles down. As soon as you know, they spend all the money in R&D and the high-end flagship projectors... They figure everything out there where they can afford to when they right. charge on the higher prices and those trickle down and trickle down into the, you know, the ones that, you know, average consumers can, can right. afford. So, so that's what I'm excited about. Yeah. I mean, this category, um, uh, I mean, projectors have been evolving um, year after year, um, but they're also competing now with large OLED and micro LED flat panels, which are sneaking up on them. So is the, is the projector category, it's going to still be relevant is maybe the better question. Yeah. Well, um, I think it will be for a while. Um, the micro LED TVs that you're talking about, um, you know, I, I thought it was funny and I, I wrote a short article about this on big picture, big sound is that, you know, you can buy Sony's 220 inch micro LED TV. They sell it at, at B and H photo for okay. $606,000. So <laughs> if you want a 200 inch TV, right. is the Sony micro LED, the crystal LED going to look better than one of these projectors? Well, hell's to the yeah, but for 600 grand, <laughs> right. you know, it should, right? Right. So, and that's an extreme, right? I mean, and right. Samsung makes a micro LED as well, and it's maybe only in the hundred to $120,000 range. Right. Um, I think you get the point, right? To, to yeah. get those screen sizes, you know, above a hundred inch or even right. at the hundred inch, to get a good quality flat panel at that price, uh, I mean, it, it, you can't get it at that price. So, right. you know, you could you can take a two thousand dollar projector, right? Maybe it's not four K, maybe it's ten eighty p. Blow it up on a really nice screen and set up a nice sound system, and you're going to get a much more cinematic effect than you would get spending three times more on a flat panel TV. Right. So, I think there's still a niche for it. Um, certainly in the larger screen sizes and will be for the foreseeable future. Right. I mean, I always say like, well, I always say it. How, like, how many times have I said this? But You're about to say it once. I'm, I'm about to say it once. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, say, um, don't spend all your money on the video when you can spend right. it on the audio. Right. Is the other right. part of that equation is truly want an immersive home theater. Yeah. And you can't get that out of a sound bar, no matter how hard you try. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. There, I said it once. Uh, I don't have to always if say If you say it, it again, then you can say, as I've said in the past, and will I've again. Said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, the audio is extremely important. Um, yes. But, yeah, we covered the long throw category in this video. Mm -hmm. We want to point you to our other video on the ultra short throw projector models, where we covered those. And have our standout winner from that and yeah i want to thank chris for his time and sure. uh 
braving those long hours staring at the screens over hey, two days. Is, for me, it's fun. I mean, yeah, you get a little tired after two hours. I mean, two days of it, eight hours a day. But to be able to see these, you know, really strong performers, you know, I right. get I get samples in for review and I get to see them. And like you said, with your Samsung, it looks amazing, right? Right. But you don't have a point of reference. Here we mm -hmm. have the point of reference. And maybe right. it wasn't perfect. They weren't all calibrated. But you can right. really see, you know, what people are talking about when you see them all next to each other. So that's right. what I love about these events is the ability to just see all the technologies on display, level playing field, and right. you know, just may the best projector win. Yeah, and we certainly want to thank Robert for putting this on. Yep. It's an incredible amount of work and setup. Yep. Uh, it's unbelievable. And Philip Jones for hosting. Um, also, a ton of work and time involved in all this. I want to thank everyone and for having us invited and having you there. So uh, yeah, and I'm uh, looking forward to the next one.